Welcome again. In today's lesson, we look at topic 4.2.7. Describe the case history of a natural area of biological significance that is threatened by human activities. 4.3.1. State the arguments for preserving species and habitats. And 4.3.2. Compare and contrast the role and activities of intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations in preserving and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity. Let's take a look back at our last lesson, which required us to plan for sustainable development using a model or all of the parts or groups or stakeholders and how they link together to solve the problem of the decline of leatherback turtles. And if you need to go back to that lesson, you can do so by clicking here. We noted that the problem of decline of the leatherback turtle was truly an international issue. With the turtles found in all of the oceans of the world and nesting on a range of beaches around the equator. With a problem of this nature, meaningful solutions can only be had through international cooperation. And where this is required, the United Nations must play a key role. The United Nations often works with governmental organizations, ministries of the environment, departments of the environment in both developed countries and in developing countries. International agreements are made and intergovernmental organizations are set up. These intergovernmental organizations work with countries of differing capabilities, of differing levels of wealth and technological ability to lay down certain laws and agreements. The enforcement of these laws often presents an issue because depending upon the wealth of the country, the level of implementation and enforcement of laws would be different. This is especially a problem with a case like the protection of the leatherback turtle, with some countries affording protection of its beaches and others unable to do so. There's also a role for science and technology in tracking turtles. This role usually falls in the lap of the developed countries as they take the lead in helping the developing countries. This type of cooperation is often orchestrated by the intergovernmental organizations. In the case of the leatherback turtle, a simple yet effective technological tool known as the turtle exclusion device can go a long way toward protecting the turtles. But in the absence of international law requiring TEDs and in the absence of effective enforcement, such a technological tool would prove less effective in this case. It means, therefore, that the problem has to be examined from the top down, but also from the bottom up. Because many of the countries that are home to leatherback nesting sites are less developed countries and poachers and fishermen are often people who live below the poverty line. Their actions are often dictated by certain needs which are driven by poverty. The role of education therefore becomes very important and 
this though it can come from the top down is often better when it comes from the bottom from a local organization that takes the responsibility to train fishermen and train poachers and to educate them in the importance of the species and how it can help them in their lives and what they can do to help the leatherback and what's in it for them if they conserve the leatherback. When such an approach is taken, then we say that we are following the principle of subsidiarity and people are being empowered to solve their own problems. Organizations that work at the level of small towns and villages educating people and empowering them when these organizations are born from within the community itself we term these grassroots organizations sometimes grassroots organizations become widely established and spread themselves over a large region in such cases we would classify them as a non-governmental organization in other cases, non-governmental organizations may come from ecocentric interests in developed countries and they may come from the outside and assist in empowering local communities in developing countries. Or they may work in conjunction with a grassroots organization or they may sow the seeds of a grassroots organization. And such a plan is one that is required to allow for the successful management of leatherback decline. There is a role for science and technology. There is a role for education. And there is a need for laws and the enforcement of laws. But Compliance with laws are best had when local communities are educated and informed about the benefits of conserving the target species. And there is a role for non-governmental organizations and grassroots organizations to play in this scenario, to learn more about the principles of empowerment and subsidiarity you should go and have a look at this document cited here. As pointed out here in this case, science and technology cannot bring about solutions by itself. For these solutions to be had, there is the need for laws, for education, for people's participation at all levels. Let's consider this in more detail by answering the question posed in the last lesson about TEDs. In our last lesson, we were required to read a section of this document and to evaluate the use of turtle exclusion devices, TEDs, in protecting leatherbacks and other marine turtles. This picture shows a loggerhead turtle escaping through a TED. This turtle exclusion device is fitted into trawl nets and it consists of a barrier that would prevent the turtle from becoming entangled in the net and then allow it to escape through a hole that was set up like other types of technological solutions the very creation of a simple yet effective solution like an addition to the trawl net does not in itself bring about conservation of the leatherback species and there is a role for conservation groups which include non-governmental organizations to assist in helping grassroots organizations, fishermen's organizations, 
to understand why they should use TEDS, it's very likely that many fishermen would find the cost of modifying nets and including TEDS to be a serious concern and a limiting factor. Most countries do not have laws that require the use of turtle exclusion devices. In the United States, the Department of State and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Fisheries Section have set up the framework for all trawling vessels to be equipped with TEDS. And the United States requires seafood eco-labeling, choosing only to import shrimp from countries that have TEDS fitted in their trawling vessels. Not all countries are able to afford this because not all countries have the level of wealth and although it may seem that it is a fairly simple device for subsistence fishermen in developing countries, this is a severe limiting factor. Other organizations like the WTO, the World Trade Organization, have become involved in arbitrating the cases that were raised and brought to them by developing countries like India and Thailand who were appealing the seafood ban imposed by the United States. So not all countries are capable of employing the use of TEDs. While the TED or the turtle exclusion device is a very effective means of protecting the turtles and while some countries through their governmental organizations have set up a very effective means of protecting the turtles other countries are lagging behind. So there is the need for this global communication and global network and there is the need for the involvement of intergovernmental organizations, the GOs. There is a role for non-governmental organizations or NGOs to participate and to work with grassroots organizations and to help in allowing devices like TEDS to be used successfully by all fishermen and to empower the fishermen to educate them so that they would understand the benefits of using TEDS. Not only does the TED help in preventing bycatch like turtles, it also uh, protects sharks and it also helps by excluding large creatures like turtles from the nets. It also improves the efficiency of the catch because it leaves more area within the net to be filled by shrimp. And it is information like this that has to be effectively disseminated to the grassroots levels and to the fishermen so that they would be able to work out and to see for themselves that there are benefits to be had in conserving the turtles and in avoiding bycatch. The TED by itself is not able to effectively address the issue of leatherback decline. And for it to be effective, there are a number of legal and socioeconomic issues that have to be addressed. And for such issues to be addressed, there are key roles for intergovernmental organizations, governmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, and grassroots organizations. The case of the California condor was also considered in our last lesson. And you can return here to have a look at the videos and the talks associated with this case. And we were required to examine the social, economic, and scientific reasons for the success of this program. And again, we see that scientific solutions cannot work by themselves as we look to answer this question and to make a model to show all of the stakeholders and how they work together to solve the problem of the California condor.
Recalling from the start of Michael Mace's TED Talk, there was a heated debate in the United States as to whether or not the condor species should be allowed to die in dignity or whether or not human beings should take the responsibility for the species' decline upon themselves and then have the ethical responsibility to bring the species back from the brink. This problem required intergovernmental agreements between the United States and Mexico, but most or all of the work in saving the species came from technical sources within the United States. But technical sources by themselves could not have brought the success, for it was a combination of laws such as the banning of DDT, which dates back to the early days of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and then laws to ban the use of lead. Effective enforcement of these laws was helped by the fact that grassroots organizations like hunting associations were well educated about the need to conserve the condors, about their historical significance, about their ecological significance, about their cultural significance, and they were willing participants in moving over from lead bullets to bullets that were made of copper and steel. This education would have also helped with the issue of microtrash, with the awareness that microtrash causes problems for condors hunters and the public in general would be more cognizant of the need to avoid the creation of such kinds of harmful waste. And then, of course, there was the key aspect to saving the condor. The successful conservation innovation by the San Diego Zoo and other zoos within the state of California. Successful use of vaccination to prevent the birds from being affected by the West Nile threat and the use of hand puppets to carry out the so-called double clutching and to increase the population in captivity at a faster rate. With all of these successful efforts going on, the breeding in captivity proved to be a success. But upon release, it also required the participation and the cooperation of the power companies. These were just some of the key issues that were successfully addressed in the conservation of the California condor. And it required governmental organizations working with grassroots organizations and scientific organizations. It is clear that while technical solutions often play a significant role in solving environmental problems, they cannot stand by themselves. And there is the need for participation by governmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, and the need for laws, successful enforcement of laws, and for education. So with all of this information fresh in our minds, let's consider the deforestation of a tropical rainforest, a case study of the unique biodiversity of Madagascar and how a range of social, economic and political issues have affected the unique forest and biodiversity of this island in the Indian Ocean. And I would like you to study this document and to describe the reasons for the deforestation, which is obvious in this NASA image. Another question to address is why conserve species and habitats? People have different perspectives on the environment and we consider people as being ecocentric in their perspective, being technocentric in their perspective, and being 
anthropocentric in their perspective. But no matter what the perspective, one common goal tends to be the protection of the environment. In some cases, it may not be the first priority. In some cases, it might be motivated by financial gain or human well-being. But most individuals see the need to conserve species and habitats. What are some of the reasons for wanting to conserve species and habitats? Why should we take the time to save leatherbacks or protect rainforest? There could be ethical reasons where we take the ecocentric perspective and we feel that nature has its own right to planet Earth. There could be people-centered reasons where we would like future generations to experience the beauty of lakes and the ocean and the rainforest and the wildlife. It could be for the technical reason of conserving genetic resources so that crops which were derived from wild species would be better protected from new types of diseases. Of course, there is the commercial benefit of conserving habitats, which, when used sustainably, can provide a range of resources from pharmaceutical products to timber. It's important, though, to consider the opportunity cost of using the environment. For example, when a forest is cut down for agriculture or for its timber, what are some of the opportunities that we lose by way of things like genetic resources or the aesthetic beauty or other commercial sources like ecotourism and, of course, the key concern of system stability. Deforestation can lead to soil erosion and to changing weather patterns. It is clear, therefore, that there are several reasons for conserving species and habitats. Environmental issues often do not stop at the boundaries that were created by people. The international nature of many environmental issues creates a key role for international cooperation. UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program, play a key role in coordinating this international effort. The wheels of political change turn way too slowly for some interest groups, particularly ecocentric groups. And this has spawned the growth of many non-governmental organizations with environmental interests like Greenpeace and the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Here, the iconic panda of the Worldwide Fund for Nature is shown on the one side and the UN on the other side with its symbol and its headquarters in New York City. As a comparison is drawn here as to some of the similarities and differences between the intergovernmental organization or the GO and the non-governmental organization or the NGO. With the use of the media, for example, the intergovernmental organization has already access to the media and they can make more elaborate documentaries and presentations that reach all corners of the earth. Whereas the non-governmental organizations, depending upon their strength, may not have such access to the media. Although, with the advent of the World Wide Web, this difference is not as profound as it used to be. The speed of response, as previously mentioned, is a lot faster in the case of the NGO, who are not bound by international laws. With these diplomatic constraints not being a factor, NGOs can respond a lot faster to issues and they do not have to worry about the 
political agenda of various parties or interest groups serving the ecocentric perspective of their followers. Often NGOs may be banned from working in certain countries and their political influence does not exist beyond all borders. But intergovernmental organizations, though they have similar kinds of restrictions, are often not bound by these restrictions to the same extent because most countries are members of the United Nations and may be signatories to the various agreements and conventions.